Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Margaret Bao. I'm with USDA Rural Development, and today we will go over the steps to starting a cooperative. So thank you for joining us. And without further ado, let's go over what the contents of this presentation will, will cover. There are various ways to form a cooperative. Uh, one would be member initiated. Another is incubated by an outside organization. And the third is conversion to cooperative ownership. We're going to spend quite a bit of time today on the steps of a member-initiated cooperative as a, touchstone, as a touchstone to the steps to actually forming a cooperative. And then we'll, we will elaborate on the various variations of forming a co-op. The first way to form a co-op is member-initiated. And this is a startup business idea. And that business idea is envisioned by the people that are going to become the eventual members of that cooperative business. And there are two ways of doing that. Uh, I like to use the analogy that either a group of people can, can follow a recipe, uh, the recipe being the steps to forming a cooperative, which we, we, we will go over today, or you can go into more depth in particular industry sectors that have quite a bit of support. I would use that as an analogy to taking a, a cooking class uh, with, a, with a chef that will guide you through the process. Another way of forming a cooperative is one that is incubated. Once again, this is a startup business, but the business is incubated by some type of development group and then the cooperative is transplanted amongst recruited members uh, who, who become the owners of the cooperative. The third type of way to form a cooperative, and something that is becoming, uh, gaining quite a bit of popularity in the United States, is a conversion, transferring an existing business into shared ownership. Uh, it can happen either in a planned way in which the current owners of that business planned to, to sell or share that business with the eventual member owners, or it can be an uh, unfortunate or crisis situation in which you've got a lemon of a situation and there is a group of people that try to make lemonade out of a bad situation and, and they take over the business as a cooperative. So let's move forward and go into depth on the steps of actually forming a cooperative. And we'll follow the outline of a member-initiated co-op. Well, as with any cooperative, as with any business, it all starts with an idea an idea for a business that's viable. And then the second thing to think about is that with this business concept, could a group effort address the issue at hand? So the second step to forming a cooperative is to explore the idea. What exactly is the business idea? What is the concept? And once again, is a cooperative structure the best way to meet that shared need? And I like to talk about discussing that idea in a Margaret Mead type of group. And what I mean by that is uh, there's a famous quote by another person whose parents uh, blessed her with the name Margaret, um, that never doubt that a group of small, that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And that quote is from uh, an often quoted uh, uh, saying from Margaret Mead. So when this group of people come together, they will start gathering information. First of all, information about what exactly is a cooperative and what are some other legal structures, some legal options of incorporating that are out there, what makes sense for the group as, as you do your research. You'll also want to look at other cooperatives in both your industry sector whatever business you're going into, and also what other types of cooperatives, what other co-ops are there in your area, be it the local area, be it a greater region, be it the state, be it a little larger than that. 
The next thing that people within this group will want to do is start learning about the co-op principles and the co-op values. Um, we, I had the opportunity to present some of that in an earlier webinar presentation. If you're interested in that information, uh, we do have recordings available through the USDA. And there's, there's if also if you do a Google search, there's lots of good information out there about the, the co-op principles and the co-op values. The next thing you'll want to research is learning about the ownership culture. What does it mean to own a business together? Uh, there is something that uh, cooperatives are one of the few places in our economy where people actually get to participate in a democratic way. And there needs to be some skills that go into that, looking into that, gathering information, sharing that information amongst yourselves. Another important subset within gathering information is something that I hold very near and dear to me is the importance of discussing your mission and your values. Oftentimes I run into groups that think that, oh, that's kind of touchy-feely and we want to get right down to business. And I would counter that every business within a year and a half to two years of opening for business is going to run into some type of, uh, some type of problem, some type of issue. That's just the nature of being in business. And if the group hasn't taken the time to really thoughtfully think through and agree upon their shared mission and their shared values, it's going to become quite apparent when people face that problem together and they realize, oh, wait a minute, you thought this co-op was about that, but I thought this co-op was about this. So when you run into an issue, you can use those shared values and that shared mission as a touchstone to say, wait a minute, let's step back. We've all agreed upon that the, that the reason that we're in this co-op is for this. And given our shared values, what options do we have for moving forward? It can really help to clarify where you want to go into the future, especially during those, those inevitable struggles that any, that any uh, cooperative business faces. Uh, the next part of gathering information is to be sure to identify some resources to help you as you move forward, as you explore. Um, you, if possible, it would be wonderful to have some type of project coordinator. This would be someone that is paid some type of stipend to be kind of the taskmaster. Um, Busy people tend to uh, be the ones that are forming cooperatives, and it's very helpful to have everyone that checks in with everyone, either by email or, or a phone call or in person, to make sure everyone is, is moving forward, doing the tasks that they had agreed to do, uh, setting meeting times, taking care of, uh, taking care of that coordination effort. Uh, it's also helpful to identify some resources in the community, in the region, across the country that can help you uh, both with cooperative and business consultants, uh, both with the exact details about the cooperative process and also about uh, the particular industry that you're exploring. And then once again, you'll want to further define, further refine that business concept that you are, are uh, creating, that you're incubating. So as you've been gathering that information, there's some key questions to keep in mind. Is this a sound business idea? Is it viable? Once again, is there an advantage to working as a group rather than trying to go it alone? And if it is worth doing as a group effort, is the co-op model the best structure for meeting your needs? And also, is the idea worth doing? Uh, forming any type of cooperative will take time, financial and social resources, and a lot of energy on the part of the people that are, that are forming the co-op, the people that are going to become members of the co-op, their families, their friends, their community. You will want to ask yourself, is this cooperative concept, is it going to make a major difference in your life and in the lives of, of other people that are going to be members of the co-op. You want to be clear that cooperatives are all, are all about businesses. These aren't hobbies. And I'll, I'll give an example from my own life. I've got a, a, I had a crazy neighbor across the street. Her name was Arlene. 
And um, Arlene used to work part-time at a local yarn store. Uh, it was a, uh, I think it was called the Yarn Emporium where I live in, in central Wisconsin. And the woman that started that store, unfortunately, uh, she developed an allergy to fibers. And this yarn store was her lifelong dream, and she had to give up the dream. She had to, she had to close the store. Uh, it was affecting her health. So Arlene came bounding across the street and said, Margaret, I have an idea. Let's save that yarn store. Let's form a co-op. And I had to kind of um, caution Arlene and ask her some key questions about this, this cooperative idea. Uh, this is what she thought would be a good consumer co-op. People that have bought yarn from the Yarn Emporium over the years, they could come together and they could form a co-op and they could run this yarn store. So I had to ask a few questions of Arlene. Number one, is knitting or crocheting a hobby to you? Or is this part of your livelihood? Are you knitting or crocheting or, or weaving, whatever you're doing, are you selling this for sale? Or is this, is this supporting you in some way? And Arlene said, oh, no, no, it's a hobby. Okay, okay. Then I asked her, are the supplies difficult to come by? Are these specialized yarns that, uh, that only the Yarn Emporium uh, carried? Or do you think you and others would just start buying yarn from the local big box, from the, from the Joanne Fabrics or the Michaels or whomever um, is selling yarn these days? And she said, well, I'm not sure. And then I asked Arlene, um, do you think that the yarn enthusiasts in the community would be willing to invest their time and their money to cooperatively own a store together? And Arlene said, well, I don't know about that. So um, you know, we did not go ahead and I didn't help Arlene to form a cooperative. But I just wanted to share with you that um, people may think, hey, let's form a co-op. But you really need to step back and think, is this worth the time and the effort? Are people going to put resources into this for the long haul? Because forming a cooperative is going to take two, perhaps three years to do. So it, it needs to be worth the effort, and it needs to make a major difference in people's lives. So you've been gathering information. You've, you've answered some key questions. This is the time, if you think this is worthwhile, to hold an exploratory meeting. And this is where that small Margaret Mead group of people that have been exploring this would present the concept to others that may be interested. Um, if there is interest, this would be the time to form a steering committee. Uh, but I caution, when you form a steering committee, I've learned the hard way, that you don't want to just pass around a blank sign-up sheet. Um, oftentimes, it takes busy people to get things done. And frankly, busy people are not going to volunteer on a sign-up sheet to, to, uh, to be on a steering committee. What you want to do is some of the key people that have been exploring this, that have, been, have, have the vision behind this cooperative, that you would want to individually approach and ask people within the community who have some valued skills. Either they've got some knowledge about the industry, they understand finances, they've got credibility uh, within the local community, they're, they're, they're good at bringing people together. They've got some skills that can really help move this forward. And you'll need to do the personal ask because once again, busy people don't tend to volunteer. They need to be asked. Um, this is also a time at that exploratory meeting that you'll want to ask for some earnest money. Um, whether or not we'd like to acknowledge it, uh, there will be some costs involved with organizing a cooperative, incidental expenses. But also, quite frankly, a little bit of money is a good indicator of commitment, of putting some money down. And um, make it realistic. Uh, depending on the group of people you're working with. So, so we come to our first decision point. So you've had the exploratory meeting, gauging the interest with the group, and the enthusiasm or lack of enthusiasm of that initial Margaret Mead group. You'll want to think for yourselves, is this proposal realistic? Is the co-op a possible solution to, to what we're trying to achieve? Have people shown interest? 
If they have, then you'll want to proceed to the feasibility study. And if not, stop. And that's okay. There's nothing worse than trying to push through an idea that just doesn't have traction. I once had a, 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 a boss that said, you know, sometimes there are ideas whose, whose time has not come yet. You may be a little ahead of the curve, and that's okay. Put it, put it on the back burner mentally. You may come back to it at a later date in a couple years. But if there is an enthusiasm, stop, and that's okay. That's okay. We all give you permission to stop. So if you do proceed, the next step is conducting a feasibility study. And this is a broad stroke look at what is happening in the industry that you're trying to break into, that you're trying to form a new business. Is that business concept viable? You'll want to do an industry analysis. You'll want to look at the market potential, some technical aspects of whatever you're, you're going to do. What are the capital requirements for proceeding? Any type that you'll want to put together financial projections. And you'll want to create some scenarios of the best case scenario, the so-so scenario, and the worst case scenario. Um, a feasibility study should be done by a third party, an independent analysis, someone that um, has some knowledge of that industry that you're trying to break through. But you'll, it's, it's a broad stroke of what's going on in the is industry. What are the opportunities? And for you to try to think through, hmm, you know, what are the opportunities for us? So if you've done that feasibility study, and it, and it will take several months for someone to do a thorough feasibility study, you reach yet another decision point. You'll have to figure out if the concept, once again, still is viable. And after that thorough review, does the steering committee wish to pursue the business? Then proceed to conduct a business plan if you think, yes, the feasibility looks promising. If not, once again, stop. Don't proceed. That's perfectly okay. If you've done the feasibility study and it looks like, huh, yes, there's a need, but there just isn't, you know, it, it, it won't be financially viable or what have you, or there isn't as much of a need as you thought there would be, or the market is changing so quickly, or what have you, whatever the situation is. It's okay to stop. Like I said, you could put it on mentally on the back burner, revisit it when market conditions change, but at the present moment you may want to stop. But if you do proceed, the next stop step is to conduct a business plan. And a business plan is a detailed look at the proposal for your venture. This is where you will take the details out of that feasibility study about what's going on in the industry and then narrow it down to, to, you, to your co-op. You'll want to do a description of the product or the service that you're going to offer. You'll want to come up with a marketing plan specific for your co-op, um, specific operational details, what the management and the organization will look like, what your financial plan is, what type of capitalization is necessary, what type of equity that you can raise amongst yourselves. Um, the business plans tend to be done internally. You would oftentimes pull information from that feasibility study, but then put in the personalized details of what you're going to do, what your cooperative is going to do. So once again, this is the next decision point. Uh, if the market potential looks sufficient, if member participation is still sufficient, if your capitalization chances look reasonable, then you would proceed to the next stop of incorporation of the business. If not, stop, and that's okay. Uh, you may save yourselves lots of money and heartache uh, if, the business, if you just can't pull together a good business plan based on the feasibility study, based on the interest of the group, and that's okay. But if you do decide to proceed, then it comes time for um, some policy documents and, and legal documents. This is where you would actually draft bylaws and articles of incorporation. 
Um, and one thing I'd like to caution, um, oftentimes people think, oh, I'll just borrow some bylaws from, from another cooperative or uh, another cooperative either in my area or another cooperative across the country in the same industry. I would caution against that because what you'll want to do is form a subcommittee. You don't have to have the entire steering committee involved with this, but a subcommittee uh, to, to work on the bylaws because this is an opportunity to define your structure and such key issues as membership requirements into the future, how many board seats you're going to have, when your fiscal year will run. Will it, will it be calendar year or maybe it will be um, the start of the growing season to the end of the growing season, or I worked with a group of dance teachers and they went with the academic year, whatever makes sense for your, your cooperative business. Uh, you'll also want to look f uh, what are the requirements for amending the bylaws, what happens in the case of dissolution. It's a lot easier to have these discussions in theory than rather when you're digging, dealing with some tough issues and personalities are involved. Um, after you've, you have that subcommittee working on this and they, and they share it with the, with the larger steering committee group, uh, you'll want to have those bylaw drafts and the Articles of Incorporation drafts that you've worked on reviewed by an attorney that is familiar with co-op law either in your state or in another state. Uh, something to think about, um, here in the United States, uh, cooperatives are incorporated under state statutes and state statutes vary from state to state. Um, there's quite a bit of variability. And so you can certainly incorporate in your state, or if you feel that your state statutes aren't going to allow you to do what you need to do, you can certainly incorporate in another state that has uh, more uh, amenable uh, uh, statutes, and then you can file as a foreign corporation in your home state. Um, and that's something that uh, we're fortunate across the United States. We have cooperative development centers. Um, good people at those co-op development centers can help you think through some of these issues and put you in touch with some attorneys uh, in your state that are knowledgeable about cooperatives. Another thing to think about as you're putting together your legal and policy documents is that who is actually going to sign the Articles of Incorporation? Oftentimes it's the steering committee that they will be the ones that physically do that. And um, those initial incorporators often serve as the interim board until the membership of the cooperative is actually able to elect from amongst themselves a board of directors. And oftentimes there's a stipulation in your state statute saying that that needs to happen within six months or within a year, what have you. Um, and an attorney uh, that is knowledgeable about cooperatives can certainly uh, advise you on that, or your local friendly co-op development center. So you want to go ahead and incorporate with a state. And then as you're doing that, you'll also want to develop some policies and good business uh, controls, uh, such as accounting checks and balances, if you're going to hire employees for your cooperative, you'll want to create a personnel policy handbook. Uh, oftentimes an attorney uh, can help you with that. Uh, he or she may have something available. Your local friendly co-op development center may have some leads on that, uh, what have you. You'll also want to create some membership agreements, if that makes sense. And you'll also want to create some policies for running the board effectively and efficiently. I would uh, really stress uh, creating some type of conflict of interest agreement amongst the board um, members to move forward. And once again, your, your friendly co-op development center can help you out with that. Okay, the next step, you've drafted those articles and bylaws for the group. So now it is time to have an organizational meeting with everyone that may be interested in actually joining the cooperative. And this is the time in which the steering committee would present the findings of both the feasibility study and the business plan and be prepared to answer good questions. Um, this is the time where people within the group would adopt 
the bylaws, formally adopt the bylaws. They would go ahead and elect the board of directors. And then this is also the time when you would start collecting any type of membership equity requirements that, um, that are required. There are various ways to go about funding a cooperative. The first three on this slide are, uh, would be a above, uh, would be considered assets, would be considered equity, and the bottom two would be considered more of a liability. Um, the first, uh, and cooperatives combine, <laughs> combine these, they don't follow just one capitalization strategy. Um, membership equity, both an initial equity requirement, $500 down, $25 down, $10,000 down, depending on the complexity of, of your cooperative business. And there may be an annual membership equity requirement. Uh, you could also collect transaction fees. It's, it's very common in agricultural cooperatives to use something uh, called per unit retains, and some type of surcharge on each item sold. For instance, there may be a 5% surcharge on each 100 weight of milk, fluid milk that is sold through a cooperative, or uh, a 2.5% surcharge on, on, on each product brought through a food hub, or, or what have you. Uh, with worker co-ops, it's common to have some type of hourly withholding for new members to, to, pay, uh, to pay their uh, membership equity, their, uh, uh, their requirement for becoming a member owner of the business. And the next option is some type of equity drive. Uh, and there's two options here. You could do common stock to the members, and this is uh, common stock is um, it gives rights to voting within the cooperative, and it's usually the same amount of money, uh, oftentimes a, a relatively low amount. Um, it depends. It depends on the complexity of the cooperative. It could be a high amount as well, but it's the same amount for everyone. But then you can also offer preferred stock. And this, is, this can be offered to both members and to people in the community. And uh, this is what I call patient capital. Uh, people will invest in the cooperative, they'll buy stock with the realization that um, by IRS regulations they can't receive more than 8% return on investment. Uh, however, the going rate for most cooperatives for a new startup is probably more in the 4 to 5% interest rate. Um, it, it's agreed upon. Uh, the co-op board will set that. Um, sometimes I've seen uh, preferred stock being sold at, you know, just to cover the cost of inflation. Uh, like I said, it's patient capital. Um, it has very limited voting rights. It's not something, it's, it's um, a wonderful tool that we in the co-op community have that as long as you offer preferred stock within your state, uh, you tend not to have to file with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, which is, uh, and the reason for that is there's an understanding with the Securities and Exchange Commission that a cooperative is a democratic business. It's all about good information flows, people understanding what is happening uh, within the cooperative, transparency. And so you don't need to file with the Securities and Exchange Commission and have all kinds of documentation of what could possibly go wrong with your investment. It's understood that it's, it's very close to the community. People know what they're getting into, and the SEC doesn't need to get involved. Um, if you're going to offer preferred stock, I would highly recommend working with an attorney uh, that is familiar with co-op preferred stock. But it is a powerful tool uh, for funding a cooperative. The next options are subsidized loans and grants, and you could certainly have loans from members within your co-op that uh, there's an agreed upon uh, return uh, and uh, by a specific date and a specific amount. Uh, but someone, uh, several people that believe very firmly in, in the goals of the cooperative, they be, may be willing to, uh, to loan several thousands of dollars to, to help get this co-op off the ground. Uh, there may also be some local community grants. However, I truly caution, don't become dependent upon grants. 
uh, grants are only appropriate for co-op development in the early stages of bringing the group together and education. But once you start getting into the capitalization and the operations, these are businesses and you really need to structure yourself as a business. So, so make sure that uh, uh, there's that firm understanding and you move forward with that from the very beginning. And then the next option, of course, is going out uh, at a market rate loan. So we've gone over funding. Um, the next step after you've, you've capitalized your cooperative is the actual startup of the business. And there's some immediate tasks that happen after incorporation. Uh, you will get something from your state about a tax ID number. And uh, there's something um, rather peculiar. You will uh, be asked to uh, go to the IRS website and, and um, put the information to get that tax ID number. Um, if you work with a co-op development center or give me a call, I can walk you through it. On the IRS site, it's kind of um, embedded pretty deep to find out where you want to um, um, incorporate, put your tax ID number. It's under Subchapter T, under Farmer Cooperative, and even if you're not involved with agriculture, you still have to put it under Subchapter T, Farmer Cooperative. And I, I do wish the IRS would make that more transparent, but anyhow. Um, uh, the next would be um, actually buying some insurance, board insurance and business insurance. Uh, and, and please don't skimp on that. Um, insurance is out there for a reason, for the worst case scenario, and you don't want to be caught without it. Uh, any type of licenses that are needed. And then if you are hiring employer, employees, you will certainly need to uh, start workers' compensation for them. Uh, go ahead and hire a manager. But remember that with a cooperative, that the manager reports directly to the board of directors. But then the manager is empowered to hire other employees as she or he sees fit. Uh, those employees will, will report to the manager, not to the board. And then it's the manager that reports directly to the board. And then you can go ahead and acquire facilities, equipment, and do whatever you need to do in order to begin operations. But remember, with a cooperative, this is, as with any business, this is just the beginning. So what's important as you're developing a cooperative um, aside obviously from, from the operations and making sure uh, things are, are flowing along well is some of the, the more governance side of things. Uh, you'll want to provide as a co-op developer, as someone that's assisting with co-op uh, creation of a co-op, you'll want to be sure that you get some good board training for the co-op. Um, you'll want to help this group of people foster some long-term thinking. Um, you'll want to model some good board behavior. You'll, you'll probably want to, if you're a co-op developer from outside the group, to attend uh, several of the initial board meetings of, of, of the new co-op. If you're a co-op member yourself, uh, you may want to bring in an extension agent or uh, some type of facilitator to make sure that your board gets off to a good start in, in expectations and the culture and creating some policies. Uh, the board is also tasked with having a strategic plan and making sure that you think strategically. Um, one of the things that boards often forget to do, but this is a very important um, responsibility on their part, is to do an annual review of their manager and provide good feedback, solid feedback um, to that person. And then you'll also want to encourage the board, or if you're on the board yourself or a member of the co-op, to do an annual self-evaluation. What is the board doing well? What are some opportunities for improvement? Where, where can we get some uh, continual training to do well? Um, you'll also want to make sure that uh, a cooperative is a business that's co-owned, and there's, there needs to be good, some good education and training for the cooperative members to understand what does it mean to co-own a business and how do we, how do we work in a democratic process. Um, 
if you've got new people coming into a cooperative, it's very common to require some type of co-op education and training for new membership. Um, and you'll also want to help set up some committees and create some conference calls so that you can create transparency and good information flow uh, to help the board in the decision making that they're tasked with for the good of the cooperative. And then of course every cooperative by state law is required to hold at least an annual meeting. And at that annual meeting, um, the board will share the information about what's, what, how the business is doing, share the financial information, uh, give a uh, management update, and elect a, uh, a, a board of directors as uh, board vacancies come up. So, so we just went through the steps of forming a cooperative from the perspective of a member-initiated brand new business idea and kind of following the recipe. So next we're going to talk about um, you know, with a member initiated co-op, it's kind of like you're coming together and you're forming a stone soup or you're forming a stew. Um, but what about if you want to do something that requires a little more technique, uh, that requires a little more knowledge, um, such as baking bread as an analogy. Um, so Perhaps in some specific industries, there are organizations that really help facilitate the process of forming cooperatives. Uh, for instance, historically, the rural electric cooperatives. Uh, think of that as a, uh, a, a cooking show that really went on steroids. Uh, back in 1935, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration helped form the Rural Electric Administration. And it became very quickly apparent that um, the investor-owned utilities were not going to extend electricity to rural areas. They didn't think there was enough profit. And so the REA found themselves in a role of not only providing very low interest rate loans to future um, electrical companies, but they also found themselves involved with uh, helping provide co-op technical assistance across the country in collaboration with lots of local groups, uh, be it 4-H, be it uh, FFA, Future Farmers of America back then, be it extension, university extension agents, be it uh, 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 farmers, state farmers unit, union, be it uh, um, the Farm Bureau, what have you, collaborating with them to get the word out, to get education out there in helping people in rural areas form these rural electric co-ops. And it's a wonderful story that within 10 years' time, most of rural America was electrified. But it was because of that combination of the very low interest loans through the federal government plus the technical assistance that was coordinated. And it was a mighty coordination effort, but well worth it. Uh, today, uh, I've, I'll give an example of a sector that has been quite coordinated, and it's the um, retail natural food consumer co-ops. Uh, there is a group called the Food Co-op Initiative uh, that has a wonderful website. If you Google it, that is the place to go. They have, an ex they have extensive industry knowledge about the retail natural food uh, grocery co-ops. Uh, they have a network of technical assistance, and they have some limited seed money to help out. It, it's rather limited, um, not like what the federal government provided to um, through the REA, but it's it's a wonderful mechanism to help people that want to form natural food grocery co-ops in their area to get to scale and to do it more effectively and efficiently than if they were just trying to follow the recipe, follow, follow, follow the steps of forming a co-op, and, and trying to learn that industry knowledge all on their own. So we spent quite a bit of time going over the steps of forming a member-initiated cooperative. Let's take a look at another variation on the theme. Uh, this is uh, something that has arisen across the country. Um, in the last decade or so, and I would call these incubated co-ops. Um, once again, new business ventures, but the initial organizing and uh, 
due diligence in creating a business is done by a nonprofit organization or a community development corporation or, or some type of outside entity with the idea of passing on that cooperative business to eventual members. And I like to use the analogy of growing tomatoes in a northern climate. Um, I happen to be located in central Wisconsin. And uh, we do grow tomatoes in Wisconsin and, and other northern states, um, but tomatoes tend to have a very long growing season. And that growing season, uh, if we planted tomato seeds directly into the soil outdoors, we would never bear fruit before frost comes in, um, in, at the end of September. So what we do in northern climates is that we start seeds on a windowsill or, or in a greenhouse. And that greenhouse provides a perfect condition for germination and the early growth of that seedling. And then after the seedlings reach a certain height and it's, you know, danger of frost has passed, uh, you would actually start to harden off those seedlings, which means you just take the seeds, seedlings outside in the shade for about a week so they don't get sunburned, you know, kind of protected a little bit, but they're being introduced little by little to the outside world. Um, to, to what's going to ha where they're going to be planted pretty soon, and then you actually plant the tomato seedlings in the soil. And so several months later, we d are able to enjoy delicious uh, tomatoes, but they had so s those seedlings had some incubation at the beginning of the season. So I'd like to use that analogy for starting cooperatives um, in, um, in in special specialized areas. Uh, here are some examples of incubated cooperatives. Uh, like I said, this is new business development. Uh, there's, some, there's a wonderful example in the San Francisco, Oakland um, area of California. They are um, a series of cooperatives called the Arizmendi Bakeries. Arizmendi is part of the last name of a, uh, a beloved priest in the Basque region of northern Spain who, uh, who created the Mondragon uh, cooperatives, which is, uh, if you ever get a chance, uh, Google Mondragon, M-O-N-D-R-A-G-O-N, -D -R Mondragon. Uh, it's a wonderful example of worker co-ops going to scale. Uh, there's over 100 co-ops employing ownership uh, to 80,000 people in a variety of industries. Uh, and Father Arizmendi uh, was the inspiration for that. And uh, some good folks in the San Francisco Bay Area were so inspired by Father Arizmendi that they wanted to do something like that in the Oakland area. So um, they, uh, with the help of an existing business called the Cheese Board, uh, they formed their first bakery and then formed another bakery, and then incubated another bakery, and another bakery, and another bakery. And I believe they are up to six, oh, someone will have to correct me, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and those bakeries are doing quite well, and those member owners are doing quite well, uh, earning a very good wage and very good patronage refunds uh, in an industry that doesn't always um, treat people well. So wonderful example of an incubated co-op. Another example is, um, an incubation within a targeted population. Another, and this also in Oakland, California, uh, a nonprofit called Prospera. Uh, it was formerly called Wages. And uh, they are working with low-income Latina immigrants. Uh, initially, the cooperatives that they helped form were in uh, ecologically eco-friendly house cleaning. Uh, cooperatives. Uh, that industry has become a bit uh, saturated in the Oakland Bay Area. So now they have moved into food production. Uh, they are forming uh, Mexican um, uh, popsicles, uh, creamsicles, uh, paletas. And so they are looking to, that's their first co-op, and they're looking to, to form other co-ops in, in food production. So interesting model, uh, like I said, specific industries, specific targeted communities. Another example of incubated co-ops is within a region. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Evergreen Cooperatives. It's also called the Cleveland Model. Uh, in the inner city of Cleveland, uh, there is intergenerational uh, long-term poverty uh, surrounding some what they call in anchor institutions, uh, Case Western Reserve Uni University, 
um, the Cleveland Clinic, uh, University Hospitals. Those institutions are not going anywhere. They're very much anchored in that community, but they're completely surrounded by poverty. And so some folks at uh, the Cleveland Foundation in collaboration with the Democracy Collaborative uh, came up with the idea of uh, forming worker co-ops in industries that would provide goods and services to those anchor institutions. Uh, so they have now organized a series of worker co-ops. Um, um, the first one was in laundry services. Uh, the second was in solar installation, uh, solar panels on, um, on some of these anchor institutions, and now on housing in the area. Uh, the next one is a um, greenhouse to provide uh, greens uh, to the cafeterias of those anchor institutions and other institutions as well. So it's a regional approach. Uh, it's interesting because it's not just in one industry sector. They're trying to look at different industries. Um, which has its pros and cons, uh, but it's very much a regional approach. So these are, um, um, let's see, Arismendi has been around for uh, quite a while. Uh, Prospera has been around for at least 20 years. Evergreen is a little bit younger, a little bit newer. So these are fascinating examples of incubated co-ops. Um, so we will move forward. So when you are incubating a co-op, uh, that sponsoring organization comes up with the idea. They pick the industry. They actually do the feasibility study. They conduct the market analysis, and they do the business plan for the proposed cooperative sites. Uh, the Arizmendi Bakeries, uh, they, they're very much looking at, um, uh, at uh, potential markets and where to actually place the next bakeries. Um, they figure out the financing, and they reach that go, no-go decision. And if they decide, yep, this looks feasible, we have good feasibility study, good business plan, good capitalization, they would actually go ahead and start recruiting people to become members of that proposed cooperative. So with the recruiting of membership, you would advertise the positions. You would require training in good co-op principles, understanding financials, both of the business and your personal financials, because if you can understand your personal finances, chances are you could better understand the financials of your cooperative business. Uh, information and understanding of a democratic workplace and how that's different. Um, it's, it's not the same as just being an employee. When you're, when you're a co-owner, you've got added responsibilities and add added rewards, obviously. Uh, provide task-specific training. The Arizmendi Bakeries, they will mentor the new co-ops and provide uh, uh, hands that they will take people from the existing co-ops and work side by side with folks in, in the different bread doughs and, and in the management and, and what it takes to run the next business. Um, and mentor the management uh, and actually open for business and that ongoing care and support of the co-op board and the membership and the ongoing support for the business in the initial years of operations until they're completely on their own. There are some pros and cons, as you can imagine, of the incubated approach. Uh, the strengths of that incubated approach is that you are entering into a proven industry. You're able to streamline the financing. From the member's perspective, there is a quicker startup time. There's a less opportunity for people to burn out of going through the steering committee process. Uh, and it's an opportunity for people with limited business experience to actually enjoy the benefits and the responsibilities of ownership. But conversely, there are, are weaknesses. It's a, um, when you, with an incubated co-op, you don't necessarily have that trust building process that you would go through when you start from scratch. Uh, from the member's perspective, the idea isn't born from the, from the heads of the, the founding members. Uh, members may not have deep industry knowledge of, of the business they're going into. And there's a danger of what um, I've heard called a convenient membership. Uh, that you, you know, you'll join the co-op if it's convenient for you. There's not a lot of skin in the game, so to speak. Um, with the worker co-ops, you've got the employee mentality rather than a co-ownership mentality. So it's something to think about. There's pros and there's cons to that incubated approach. The next type of co-op um, uh, structure that we're going to touch upon 
is conversion of existing businesses to cooperative ownership. And if I may sh share from a co-op development perspective, this is probably the hot topic in, in, in our profession right now. Uh, it's something that um, I'm going to provide a brief overview of uh, because if you want to go into this, you really need to dive in a little bit deeper in the training, and we just don't have the time for that today. So some examples of conversions. It can be both with consumer co-ops. It can also be with worker co-ops. Uh, the most um, a very good example of consumer co-ops conversion, uh, manufactured housing parks. Um, some people have called them trailer parks. Uh, the situation is that oftentimes in a trailer park or in a manufactured housing um, community, people own their own manufactured housing or trailer, single wide, double wide, whatever it is, they, they own it, but they rent the land underneath them. And it's not a very stable situation. There are lots of examples of uh, real estate development pressures in which the owner of that park uh, is, is made an offer. He or she just can't refuse. And so the owner may sell the park and give an eviction notice to, um, to the people that are renting there. And unfortunately, um, mobile homes aren't too mobile once they are set, <laughs> set in place. Um, and oftentimes, you know, you, the home has become fragile over time. I can't, you know, people can't afford to the, the thousands of dollars it costs to move it, and um, they're out. And it's a, it's a very unstable situation. So there is an organization called Rock USA, Resident Owned Communities USA. Um, it started in New Hampshire back in the early 80s helping to convert um, people that were facing eviction out of their, out of their park. Uh, they helped form the very first uh, uh, resident-owned community a housing co-op. And they went on to form more and help organize more and more and more. I believe there are now 114 um, housing co-op communities in, um, in New Hampshire. And, uh, the good folks at the New Hampshire Community Loan Fund have uh, helped share that knowledge and um, some visionaries there formed Rock USA to take this model nationwide. Rock USA uh, partners with uh, nonprofit organizations, co-op development centers across the country to, to do this uh, statewide or region-wide uh, where they are located. It's a wonderful example of um, consumers uh, being able to have ownership of something that's very meaningful, very important in their lives, um, their homes. Another example, other examples are uh, worker co-ops. Uh, it can be where retiring owners are looking, are interested, are open to selling their business to their employees as a way to, to keep those jobs in the region, to uh, provide a legacy for the owner. Um, to make sure that the, that the business that that owner has spent a lifetime creating continues on. And who best but the employees? Who has the most vested interest in make, make, making sure that business continues on than the employees? Uh, a good example of that is Select Machine. It's in Kent, Ohio. Uh, if you Google, you will find some good case studies documenting uh, that conversion um, several years ago. I think it's about a decade ago now. Um, there's also an example of where current owners of a, of a business want to share ownership. Um, they started the business and they didn't realize the business was going to grow like it did and um, um, they'd like to step back. Uh, they'd like to become a co-owner uh, with, uh, with the employees that have helped build up that business over time. Um, they want to stick around. A good example of that is out of Greenfield, Massachusetts. It's called Real Pickles. Um, um, well, they make uh, um, pickles and, and sauerkraut and all that kind of good stuff. And had some very loyal employees. Uh, the founders did, and they went through the process of co-owning that. It's a, it's a wonderful example. Again, if you Google Real Pickles, you'll come across some great information, uh, some very inspirational stories. Um, there is an ideal, so some things to think about. What is an ideal environment for conversion to cooperative ownership? 
Um, there's several things, several ingredients. Ideally, it would be wonderful to have a willing seller, an owner who wants to phase out of the business, or not have complete ownership of the business, an owner that is concerned about the legacy of the business, and there may not be logical successors. Uh, there not, may not be family members interested in taking it over. There may not be an outside firm that wants to, a private equity firm or uh, competitors that want to buy out the business. Um, You'll want to obviously have willing buyers, either uh, consumers or employees. Um, that business has a major impact on their lives. It's their livelihoods, it's their homes, what have you. And very importantly, it needs to be a viable business. You don't want to be straddled. You don't want to straddle a group of people with a dying business or a business in a dying industry. Um, that business needs to be profitable, needs to have limited debt, uh, and it has to be an industry that has a future. So the conversion steps, and I said for the, uh, this would, uh, con uh, con ownership conversions would require training unto itself. We're not going to go into depth, into depth, but just to say that uh, the steps to would be that willingness, assessing the current situation, getting an evaluation done, going through that process, structuring the new business, and, and uh, coming up with the capitalization, the legal documents, all that kind of good stuff, and then actually doing the deal moving forward with it. So in summary, um, we went over three different ways to, to starting a cooperative. We spent quite a bit of time on a member-initiated co-op. And once again, that's a startup of a new business where the members will go through the steps of the entire process. And they will bring all the ingredients uh, to the soup or the stew. They will work on it. They'll, they'll get some coaching. They'll, get some, they'll follow a recipe. They'll get some, uh, good, get some good techniques. But ultimately, it is their soup. It is their, their bread that they bake. Um, incubated co-ops, once again, it's a startup business. Uh, some type of development organization, be it nonprofit, what have you, will go through the organizing process. They will hire and orient uh, eventual owners of that business and transfer over time um, the ownership to, uh, to the intended um, uh, member owners of the co-op. And then the other type that we touched upon, didn't go into depth, is conversions. And that's where existing businesses um, are being converted to either consumer ownership or employee ownership. Uh, evaluate the viability, evaluate the seller willingness, and then the members will actually go through the steps of, of organizing and becoming member owners. So here is my contact information. For, um, but I also wanted to give a shout out. If you crave uh, going into more depth, if you're interested in going into co-op development yourself or you, the organization that you work with is interested in organizing cooperatives, there is some wonderful training coming up. Uh, there is an organization called Cooperation Works. It's the National Association and National Network of Co-op Development Centers and Co-op Development Professionals. And in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, Dane County where Madison is housed has uh, over 100 co-ops. It's uh, the highest per capita concentration of co-ops in the country. Um, the University of Wisconsin Center for Co-ops in collaboration with Cooperation Works is having a four-day in-depth training June 27th through 30th on the UW campus. It's a wonderful training. I'll be there. Uh, lots of, uh, we'll provide, go into real depth in the steps, you know, putting things together. We'll bring in case studies, uh, people that are involved with live groups, and we'll also go out into the Madison area and, and visit various types of cooperatives. It's a it's wonderful training. Uh, this training has been going on for over a decade. It's, it's well worth uh, the time and an investment. If you are interested in worker co-ops in particular, uh, there is a nonprofit organization called the Democracy at Work Institute. It is a, um, a group that was uh, formed out of the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops, an association of worker co-ops across the country. Um, the Democracy at Work Institute, or DOWI, is what they like to call a national think and do tank for worker co-ops. 
And the first Friday of the month, all throughout the uh, 2016, they are holding um, hour and a half webinars um, for helping people understand startup of worker co-ops. And at the end of that, uh, you are eligible for 30 minutes of uh, intensive uh, assistance from uh, experienced worker cooperators. Um, if nonprofits are interested in incubating worker co-ops, please do contact Dowie. Uh, they've got some training available, and they also have a fellowship program uh, for people that are really diving in deep into worker cooperatives. So I have managed to speak nonstop for an hour, so let's pause and go ahead and open it up to some questions. I'm sure I, hopefully there are some questions that have arisen over the past hour. So Andres, uh, Andres is going to help with uh, reading some questions, and we'll, we'll go over some of this. All right. Thank you, Margaret. Um, we've had a number of questions come in over the chat. Uh, first of all, there was, uh, it was asked, for a crisis situation, for instance, the business owner abruptly decides to close or has urgent medical issues, how quickly can a conversion type of cooperative be put together by employees to sustain the business? <laughs> well, <laughs> in an emergency, um, it may not be pretty. It may not be um, the way I mean, you may have to put the structure together rather quickly um, and go back and work on the details. But um, on an emergency, you could probably do it in two to three months' time. I, I wouldn't recommend it, but if it's an emergency, you know, that's what you need to do. Uh, in the Madison area of Wisconsin, um, uh, there's a 30-year-old worker co-op called Union Cab Cooperative. Uh, they were started under a, a one lemon of a situation. It was an existing cab company, and there was a, a strike, labor unrest going on, and the owners decided to just uh, get rid of the business. They, and so the, um, the drivers very quickly came together and uh, um, uh, formed a, a co-op and uh, had to form it very quickly and then go back and work on the details. So uh, it can be done. It's not ideal, but you know, it's better than the alternative. So yeah, two to three months' time, you could. You could. All oh. right. Uh, next, uh, let's see. This is from a this came in a bit earlier in the uh, in the presentation, but what happens to the earnest money if you stop the project? Oh, um, well, <laughs> if you haven't used it up, <laughs> you would you would return as much as you could uh, to to uh, the people that invested in it. Um, otherwise, you could uh, have an agreement that if the money isn't used, if the co-op doesn't move forward, uh, that you could donate it to another organization or, or something like that, uh, chances are you're probably going to use up that earnest money uh, either in organizing costs or uh, perhaps some legal fees. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, here's a good question. What resources are available from USDA Rural Development to support co-ops? <laughs> okay. Um, well, we, um, we do have uh, uh, the Cooperative Programs Education and Research Division, and we have wonderful materials available on our website, uh, both electronic and in print form if you're interested, that provide all kinds of recipes, information on how to form a cooperative, information about different cooperative sectors. Uh, it's the USDA Cooperative Programs uh, is probably the number one source of information about co-ops in the United States. Uh, wonderful resources there. Um, we also have something called the Rural Cooperative Development Grant Program, which funds uh, cooperative development centers across the country. Uh, there are about 30 funded co-op development centers, and uh, some are generalist centers. Um, I'll give a shout out. I, I saw Diane Gasway is on, on the call. Uh, she's the Executive Director of the Northwest, Area, Northwest Cooperative Development Center, and uh, they provide co-op development uh, to, to any type of inquiry, and they also specialize in um, the Rock USA, uh, home care worker co-ops, uh, local food co-ops. Uh, so they're a good generalist organization. Um, I had mentioned the Food Co-op Initiative. 
they are also a recipient of that Real Cooperative De uh, Development Grant. Uh, so they are able to provide some great uh, training and resources, uh, both on the web, in-person conferences, uh, and connecting people to, um, uh, to great um, uh, people with technical knowledge about specific parts of the industry. Um, so that combination of education, research, uh, um, publications, and then the co-op development that is happening uh, through our co-op development centers. All right. Um, let's see. The next question: Where would you recommend a prospective cooperative developer to find someone to provide a third-party feasibility study in Wisconsin? Oh, in Wisconsin! <laughs> oh, wow. Um, uh, you know, kind of. Um, you know, after you've been having that conversation amongst a group of people, and you're feeling, hmm, hmm, you know, hey, this is a viable idea. You've been firming up the business idea. Uh, quite a bit. Uh, you've, um, you know, you've you've looked into, you know, co-ops. What's happening in other parts of the country? What's happening in your region? Um, having that exploratory idea and, it, and if that explore, exploratory meeting, and if it looks like, hey, there's interest from other people, that's when you would go ahead and um, do the feasibility study. And um, please don't skip that step of doing a feasibility study. Some people are tempted to um, go the route of a conventional business or an LLC of just going straight to a uh, business plan. But when you're dealing with a um, cooperatively owned business, a mutually owned business, a number of people coming together, you really need to have an understanding of what's going on in the market, of what's going on in that, on in that industry before you proceed to um, further on. So actually the feasibility study is relatively early on in the process. Um, so, and if you're in Wisconsin, um, we, have, uh, we have some good resources to help you. Um, and uh, if you'd like, I'd get in touch with me and I'd be happy to put you in touch with those resources. Okay. Uh, another question that just came in that also relates to uh, feasibility studies. Mm -hmm. For feasibility studies, would these be relative to the contents of the requirements in business plan or in BP? I assume that means business plan. Okay. Uh, feasibility study. I'd like to, to differentiate between a feasibility study and a business plan. Feasibility study is the broad brush of what's going on in the industry. Business plan is about what you are going to do. Of what you, the particulars of what you're going to do given what's going on in the entire industry. Um, so yes, do the feasibility study before doing the business plan, and the feasibility study will inform lots of the components of that business plan. Um, oftentimes the group will pull together the business plan um, from you know, a lot of things that's learning from the feasibility study. All right. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, next question. Conversions are essentially a group uh, buying a business collectively? Yes. Yes, yes. Yep. Good definition, yes. Okay. And, and then they're going to own it and operate it democratically. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. So there was a question earlier um, regarding employees versus worker owners in a co-op. Would mm -hmm. a worker co-op have employees or just worker owners? Okay, very good question. Um, you can. <clears throat> a worker co-op can decide to say everyone that works, that works in this workplace after they go through some type of pre-membership period or probationary period, <clears throat> they either have to uh, join the co-op or leave. And other, and other co-ops will uh, employ people and uh, will offer membership over a period of time. So you, uh, if, you, if you've got a really successful, uh, there's a, a wonderful uh, worker co-op in, in Madison, Wisconsin called Isthmus Engineering Cooperative. Um, engineers, CAD designers, um, folks like that. And um, they will advertise for people to, to become employees. And then after a period of time, uh, they are offered membership. And the membership fee is pretty substantial. Um, 
but it's a, it's a very successful business and it's well worth investing in and becoming a member owner. Um, so it's it's really up to up to the um, to the co-op. Uh, one of the worker co-ops I helped start up in the home care industry. Uh, when we started it back in 2001. Uh, we stipulated that everyone, after a probationary period, everyone had to become a member owner or had to leave. And then about uh, what was that, 2010, um, the, the board and the membership and the membership voted to um, allow people to be just employees of the co-op and not become member owners. Um, and <laughs> now, now they're kind of questioning whether they should have done that or not. So anyhow, um, it, it can be revisited, um, but it's something to seriously talk about. And when I, when I mentioned in the early stages about talking about your mission and values, that's one of the things you're probably going to talk about, especially with a worker co-op. Okay, and there was a specific question. Would, uh, would a manager ever be one of the employees? Uh, wouldn't <laughs> Mm -hmm. Wouldn't a uh, worker owner assume the role of manager? Mm -hmm. um, it's it's up to the individual co-op, and I've seen it go both ways. Um, um, yeah, I, uh, I'm trying to think. Um, well, I know at Isthmus Engineering, they have exempted three key positions from being members uh, because they felt that those three positions had um, access to more information than the rest of the membership. Um, uh, but I've also seen other co-ops, I believe um, Equal Exchange, I believe that managers are member owners as well as, as, as people that they, they supervise. So it's, it's really up to, to the cooperative. And that's why it's important, especially with worker co-ops. These are some really big issues to think through and you'll need some guidance. And that's why I think it's very important to reach out to either the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops or the Democracy at Work Institute uh, to help you think through some of your options and, and, and get some words of advice from people that have been there, done that. All right, great. Uh, let's see. Um, are you aware of any efforts to replicate the rural electric co-op model to provide internet and broadband access today? Oh, 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 oh I wish it were so. <laughs> it's a brilliant idea. I'd love to see it. Um, um, but I've seen some states put up um, through lobbying by, um, by broadband industries that have prohibited that in various states. Um, so it's a wonderful idea, and I wish it were so, but I'm, I'm not seeing it. <sighs> okay. Do you have any advice for communities that might wish to pursue this kind of model? Um, do some outreach. Do some Google searches on communities that have. Um, I, is it, oh, I forgot. Is it Memphis, Tennessee that has a municipally owned uh, internet access. I believe it's Memphis, Tennessee. Um, Google it. Look it up. Um, I also know of some rural communities have done that. Uh, Wapaka, Wisconsin, W-A-U-P-A-C-A, -A -A, Wisconsin, uh, has had a municipally owned. Um, there are some longstanding. Um, some of the existing rural electric co-ops have looked into it as, as another option for their membership. Um, you'll have to do some, some digging. I'm not as, as up on that as I, as I should be. All right. One of our participants has flagged that it's uh, Nashville, Tennessee, not Memphis. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nashville. Thank you, Nashville. Uh, and then there was a, a question that I think is related. What about use an REA model uh, to start solar electric co-ops? Ooh, uh, there are some solar electric co-ops out there. Um, uh, both people that uh, uh, want to have solar on their own houses or on their own businesses, and then some of the existing rural electric co-ops are sponsoring uh, solar farms. That, for instance, if you can't, if you rent, or if uh, your house is shaded, uh, that you could. Uh, by membership into a solar farm and, uh, and sharing the benefits of that. Um, there are also some independent groups that are forming cooperatives to do that rather than through a rural electric co-op. Um, yeah, there's some, there's, some, oh, there's some neat things going on across the country. 
All right. Um, let's see. Uh, another similarly related question: um, What models, if any, can you think of that successfully bridge profit and nonprofit businesses? A co-op whose mission is to provide services or commodities to a disadvantaged community, for instance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, well, one thing um, I like to think about that there's different ways of going about providing goods and services. You can do it for profit. Uh, for the benefit of shareholders in a typical corporation or an LLC. Uh, you could do it not for profit, in which a not for profit is, is, is about providing education and doing charitable work. Um, a cooperative is a middle way, it's a business, but it's, it's about operating at cost. It's about providing goods and services at cost uh, if it's a consumer co-op. Um, so oftentimes people, I, I've seen a tendency going back to the 90s onward that people want to so quickly jump into, well, let's form a nonprofit. Well, that's, nonprofit is appropriate when you're dealing something with an educational or charitable purpose. But if you are really um, have a business in mind, you may really want to take a look at the cooperative model um, and don't be afraid of, of sharing patronage refunds with the membership or if it makes sense, uh, some of the food co-ops will just, instead of giving out patronage refunds at the end of the year, they'll reinvest it within the business. But what their interest with the food co-ops rather than being nonprofits, they really like that democratic process, that the consumers truly have ownership, they truly have a say. Whereas with a nonprofit board, it's supposed to be representative of the entire community, not just the needs of that particular um, group of shoppers or what have you. Um, a way to illustrate this, um, in the community in which I live, um, I was involved with helping to form a, um, a cooperative, an art, art, artist gallery cooperative. And it's a um, downtown Stevens Point, Wisconsin, in central Wisconsin. Uh, 25 artists have come together. They're juried. Uh, they are selective of uh, who they invite into membership within the artist gallery co-op. And um, it's all about displaying the art of the member owners, <clears throat> highlighting local art, their artists, their artist members in a gallery. It's a wonderful gallery. Um, but then also in town, we have an arts an arts nonprofit, uh, Riverfront Arts Alliance. And that arts alliance is all about arts for the community and, and a broader mission of promoting the arts, encouraging people to, 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 to do, be creative, do creative things. The Riverfront Arts Alliance was very much in support of the Q Artists Gallery Co-op, of forming their co-op and forming a gallery. Um, but the gallery is very much focused on their membership uh, you know, you know, they obviously are concerned about good art and you know arts education, but um, <clears throat> the gallery co-op is able to focus in on their members, whereas the artist nonprofit has a broader mission, a broader vision. So that's one way to think about it. That um, you know, nonprofits and co-ops, um, you know, co-ops may operate at a cost at cost for the benefit of the members, but in the end it is a business. Uh, whereas a nonprofit, um, there's supposed to be more of an educational or charitable purpose to it. All right. Um, so getting back to the uh, worker owner uh, issues. Mm -hmm. As an owner, would workers be exempt from workers' compensation and withholding taxes as profits would be reported to owners on IRS Form 1065? Uh, well, it depends on your state. Um, most states, um, most states where you have worker co-ops, the uh, worker owners are also considered employees and therefore they, uh, the co-op is required to carry workers' compensation um, and to, to do all that kind of stuff. Uh, there are some states that allow, um, that treat co-ops more like a, a, a group of contractors. Um, I, 
I would caution against going that route thinking that, oh, we can get away from paying workers' compensation or, you know, we don't have to do this and that. It's like there's a reason there's worker compensation and it's a good protection to have. And so this is my personal opinion. Um, I would encourage worker co-ops to, to go the route of um, treating the owners, member owners as employees as well and having those protections for employees. Um, these, this would, these are hot topics that are just discussed in, in worker co-op circles, and I would highly recommend um, that individual get in contact with DOWIE and the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops to really, really dive into some of that. There's, um, there, there are opinions uh, on, on all aspects of that. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, so you mentioned 4-H, which uh, mm -hmm. someone was excited about. Uh, <laughs> Go for you, it. Uh, a few more examples of mm -hmm. co-ops that have been 4-H efforts. Yeah. If I may offer, um, if I may offer something from my observation of I've been a co-op developer now for almost 18 years, and um, when I have worked with cooperatives that are involved with agriculture, um, oftentimes people have. Gone through the four, have gone through 4-H, they have gone through FFA. And through 4-H and FFA, they have learned some valuable skills in, in group dynamics, in, in Robert's Rules of Order, and how to conduct meetings, and how to, to, to disagree without being disagreeable. All those good democratic processes they've learned, they've had experience with. And it's, it's wonderful when I'm able to help organize cooperatives in communities that have had that FFA or 4-H experience. Uh, when I have worked with other communities, uh, such as lower income communities, uh, you know, people that are in places that are a little more urban or you know, have not been touched by FFA or, or 4-H, that essential piece of that democratic process is missing. And it takes so much of an effort for, for the organizers, someone like me, a co-op developer, to try to instill that in, a, in, a, in an efficient way. Whereas if people have had that experience through 4-H or FFA, they've had years of <laughs> that practice. And, and, and I wish more of that was available to our youth across the country because um, it sure would make co-op organizing a heck of a lot easier. All right. Um, do you anticipate domestic co-ops eventually doing business internationally, specifically in the areas of commodities like social, solar energy? Oh, uh, well, uh, co-ops obviously um, have lots of experience with um, with international trade. Uh, look at our agricultural co-ops, our well-established agricultural co-ops, uh, CHS, Sunkist, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, when it comes to solar, why not? I, I am not I, I am by no means an expert on on that industry. Um, but if there's any type of uh, precedent set by uh, by other sectors within the co-op world, um, why not? Why not? All right. Um, what is your perspective on incorporating a new cooperative entity under a state co-op statute versus establishing it as an LLC, uh, okay. since the latter is often very attractive to entrepreneurs and their lawyers? Okay, right, right. And this is where it's important. Um, it gets down to one of the rules of thumb with an LLC. It's, it's assumed that with an LLC, it's um, the same group of people over a period of time. Whereas with a cooperative by its very structure allows for entry and exit of membership without upsetting the entire structure. Uh, so that's one of the benefits of a cooperative versus an LLC. Uh, for instance, with a cooperative, um, uh, using the example from where I'm located with the state of Wisconsin, once a year the state of Wisconsin will ask the co-op who, who are your, who's, who's on your board of directors now? Because under the state, our state statutes, the, um, the 
the buck stops with the board. The board is ultimately responsible for, uh, for the cooperative uh, business. Where, whereas with an LLC, it's a relatively new entity type, and so states aren't quite sure who's in charge, and, and so um, they will ask year to year, um, please list who are the owners of this, where are their addresses, who are past owners. They're trying to keep track because they're not quite sure because an LLC has such variability uh, in its structure. They're not quite sure who's in charge, who's ultimately responsible. So that's something to think about. Um, with a cooperative, it's all about you know, the seven cooperative principles. And in co-op principle, um, Number three is member economic participation, and co-op principle number four, autonomy and independence. And so with a cooperative, you may have outside investors that buy preferred stock, but they don't get a seat on the board, or there, there are some statutes that allow for that. They don't have majority seat on the board. The, with a cooperative, the equity investment is outside investment, I should say, excuse me, the outside investments, uh, outside capitalization is decoupled from the governance of the cooperative. And, um, you know, outside investors may not like that. Well, maybe outside investors are not a good place. They're, they're, it's not appropriate for cooperatives. Uh, that's why they may be more interested in LLCs. They can take, they can have more of a, more control when they invest. Um, uh, that's why it's, when, when you set up a cooperative, it's, it's very important to have that clear communication, the transparency, that um, if you are investing in a cooperative, realize that you're not going to have a seat on, you know, it, it's, you're not going to have undue influence. Um, it's one member, one vote in a cooperative, and that may not be attractive to outside investors. Um, and that has been a perennial issue. Uh, for cooperatives for capitalization, but that's why we have a uh, national cooperative bank. That's why we have the farm credit service system. Um, be, uh, that we have lenders that understand um, understand our need for independence, understand our need for democracy, and are willing to to honor that and value that and 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 deal with that. So yes, um, and I I have certainly run into it as I'm doing co-op development of running into lazy. Excuse me. Um, um, a co uh, attorneys or, or accountants are just like, why don't you just form an LLC? You know, that, that, that's what they know, and it's easier to just just go with what you know instead of uh, taking the time to really listen and to figure out that hey, this group of people really believe in economic democracy, and, and they're setting up the structure in order to to do that. Um, so that's my two cents, and uh, I'm sure if you talk to other people in the co-op community, everyone's got an opinion about this. So. All right. Uh, in the same vein, is tax filing also easier for cooperatives than for LLC members? Um, and are there more opportunities for tax planning with cooperatives? Hmm. Ooh, that's a good question. I am not as up on some of the accounting issues of cooperatives, and I usually defer to them. There's some really good uh, accountants out there that know cooperatives quite well. Um, if you think about it, cooperatives have been around for a very long time, um, and, and, and LLCs are relatively new. Um, so, and, and, and there's a very strong precedent in, in rural America, especially with our agricultural cooperatives. And uh, so there's quite an understanding, and there's quite a bit of um, personal planning, personal financial planning that goes into that. That's well understood that, that uh, the rest of the co-op community can learn from. Um, it's not a very good answer, and, 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 I, and I apologize. I'm, I'm just not as up on some of the accounting issues as... Um, as others are, I, I would say I would defer to an accountant that's familiar with cooperatives on some of that. All right, and then uh, looks like uh, one the last thing to come in uh, is uh, going back to an earlier question: uh, BP met business programs requirements. Um, so. I guess the original question uh, for feasibility studies, would these be relative to the contents of the requirements in business programs? 
I would hope so. <laughs> I mean, um, uh, yes. I mean, with the feasibility study, there, I mean, there's just certain things that you need to have within it in order to make it worthwhile uh, for both the co-op members, the potential co-op members, as well as for uh, a USDA rural development uh, for their business and industry loan guarantee program or, or other business programs. So. Um, as, as someone, as, as a USDA employee, uh, you may want to share with the group uh, some of the things that, that they need to see within a feasibility study, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's the same thing that, uh, that, that a good business plan would, should have, that, that, that any consultant putting uh, together should, should put together. Um, and one of the neat things is, uh, you know, working here at USDA, Working with co-ops, I'm used to seeing feasibility studies and business plans that say, don't do this. Uh, whereas uh, my colleagues within USDA, um, they often joke that they have never seen a business plan or never seen a feasibility study that says, no go. Um, <laughs> so it's just an, an anomaly uh, in the co-op world. We're, we're used to saying, Ooh, you know, step back, maybe we shouldn't do this. So it's just the nature of um, um, Hopefully, uh, groups um, that have received a no-go are not asking for, obviously, loans and grants from our agency. All right, Margaret. Well, that is the uh, last of the questions, it appears, that have come through the chat. Here is a hand raised by an individual named Derek Harris. Did Derek have a chance to type in his question, or perhaps he's not able to uh, type in his question? Hi, Margaret. This is Vanjie. Derek Harris, um, his question did get answered earlier in the chat, just to let you know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that might have been it. Uh, okay. his, uh, he had typed his question, and we were working through a backlog um, okay. of you. other questions at the time. Yeah. Yeah, it was a technical question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions then. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your patience in sitting through an hour and a half on one of my favorite topics in the world, co-op development and the steps uh, to forming a cooperative. Uh, this session has been recorded and it will be available um, uh, shortly. Uh, feel free to contact me for, um, for information on, on how to uh, access that. Uh, if you would like a copy of my slides, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, so thank you very much for your patience and for your interest, and uh, I look forward to um, continued sessions and continued shared learning with you. Take care. Have a good day. <laughs>